After days of anticipation, I find myself seated in our section of the Pullman car. Harold Haas. Thousands of people arrived in St. Louis daily to attend the World's Fair. Locals came in their buggies and wagons and had to buy parking passes for their horses. The charge depended on whether they were driving a one-horse or two-horse hitch. A few people arrived via the newest Rage, the automobile. The vast majority who came from a distance traveled by train. The railroad companies provided special fares to attract people to St. Louis. On the Missouri Pacific, a ticket from the town of Nevada in far western Missouri to St. Louis could be purchased for $5.85. These low fares were so attractive that extra cars had to be added to the trains. Passengers were allowed to pack into the cars even if there was no seat available. But going to the World's Fair was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for most, so no one seemed to mind the inconveniences. Missouri Pacific No. 30 originated near Wichita, Kansas, and was running late on October 10, 1904. It passed through numerous small towns across southern Kansas. When 13 passengers boarded the train at Oxford, Kansas, superstitious folks thought that a sign of bad luck. At each depot, more passengers crowded into whatever car they could find room, hoping for a seat where a family might sit together, if they got to sit at all. Still, it was a train filled with laughing children and people excitedly talking about their expectations for the great fair. While the train full of fairgoers headed toward St. Louis, a freight train headed in the opposite direction was directed to a side track to sit and wait for four trains, including number 30, to safely pass. In 1904, train traffic was regulated by lights on trains and by telegraphs between depots. Safer, more accurate systems had been invented, but rail companies resisted them because of the cost. There were also a few regulations regarding the number of hours that train crews could work per day, leading to crews who were often fatigued and sometimes even slept on the job. The crew of the freight train had worked 17 hours that day without rest and apparently dozed off while waiting on the siding for the trains to pass. When they awoke to find the final train passing, the crew pulled the freight train onto the main line and headed on their way. They had no way of knowing that only three trains had passed, and they were on a collision course with the fourth. The station operator in a town between the two trains was surprised to see the freight pass his location at 4.04 a.m. He quickly contacted a dispatcher to stop the passenger train, but it was too late. No possible way to avoid the inevitable, the dispatcher simply said, there will be a wreck, and called emergency crews. The fast-moving trains rounded Dead Man's Curve in Warrensburg, Missouri, about 200 miles from St. Louis, shortly after 4.10 a.m. They met in a head-on crash. The first I knew of anything wrong, I heard the air brakes begin to set, and there was a rumbling sound followed by a terrific crash and a shower of hot water, broken glass, and fragments of human bodies. I kept my seat until the rush of the excited passengers was over. Everybody was able to try to escape, but the confusion was terrible. All the lights went out as soon as the crash came, and it seemed that hot steam was being blown right into our bodies. I had the presence of mind enough to throw my wrap over my face and that of a little boy. People were killed all about me. One lady just behind me and a man just opposite me were killed. I don't see how I escaped. Miss Laura Mitchell, Chitopa, Kansas. The momentum of the trains was so great that the freight engine passed over the passenger train's engine, landing on top of the first passenger car and killing 28. The boiler from the freight engine ruptured, filling that car with steam and water. Deaths were caused by either trauma or scalding. We were all held down by the wreckage so tight that we could not move and were in awful suspense. 
The car was in total darkness and filled with escaping steam and gas, and we were wet with hot water. The wrecked engine and tender were right upon us. I could reach out my hand and touch them. Everything was jammed in so tight that nothing could be moved, and we expected the wreck to take fire at any moment. The cries of the people in the wreck and their appeals for help were awful. Our friend, Mr. Darst, was lying on the floor near me with part of the engine or tender upon him holding him down. He reached up in the darkness and took hold of my arm and thinking it was his wife and said, Hattie, are you hurt? Just then someone passed with a lantern and I saw Hattie Darst sitting in her seat and when the light fell on her face, I saw that she was dead. When the light came a little closer, I looked down at his son Gilbert, lying with his head in my lap, and saw he was dead. Mr. Darst could not see them yet, and I could not bear to tell him. Mrs. Esch, Dexter, Kansas. The injured were taken to the railroad hospital in Sedalia. The dead were taken to the Magnolia Opera House in Warrensburg. Undertakers from surrounding towns were brought in, as were coffins and undertaking supplies. Within a day, the victims had been prepared and coffins were shipped by the Missouri Pacific back to hometowns for burial. When the trains arrived home, entire towns turned out to view the grim scene. In the small town of Bernal, Missouri, hundreds met the returning train, far more than the population of the town. A funeral for two young victims was held in the same church where, just months earlier, they had been flower girls. To this day, local children make sure that the stone hands of their memorial always hold flowers. There are many communities in Kansas and Missouri with few pleasant memories of the 1904 World's Fair. Instead, they remember their townspeople and loved ones, sometimes entire families, who were once excited travelers to a great fair, but would never experience the palaces or the pike. A passenger who escaped from the great train wreck with little more than a bump on the head was asked if she intended to continue her journey to the World's Fair. Feel my head, she said. I've had all the fare I want. <laughs> 